part of the frustration of data science interviews is the fact that a lot of companies, they interview like they are Facebook, Google, Apple, Netflix, when they are not those companies. When I say there's no stability in data science machine learning, I mean, it's always going to be a dynamic balance of being sort of productive and active in the present, but also sort of keeping an eye out to your future. So I don't think lack of stability is a bad thing. Maybe what I should say is that there's no stagnation. There's no stagnation. So if you're someone that enjoys a very dynamic type of work that loves to keep learning, data science machine learning is great. Welcome to the Richmond Alake podcast. This week, I'm speaking with Mikiko. Mikiko is an MOOPS engineer and a content creator. So you probably see her work on Medium and on LinkedIn, where she has a strong presence and talks about machine learning and data science. In our conversation, we touch on Mikiko's experience within the data science and machine learning field, our interview experiences, and her experiences going through boot camps. So, I'm Richmond Alake, and one person at a time, I'm exploring the stories of the humans behind AI and data. I hope you enjoy this conversation and come away a better practitioner. Thank you for listening. What's impressed you the most, let's say within the last month, what's impressed you the most? In data science or just in general? Anyway, it could be anything, just in general, in life. There's some, there's been some impressive stuff like within data science, but I think the part that sticks out to me is really just how innovative and creative humans are, both in really bad ways, but also in really, really good ways. So for example, like everything that's going on, like the Web3 space in the Web3 decentralized space, it's, it's super really, it's really interesting. Um, it is this like massive experiment in your community building, also in our kind of understanding of the financial system, understanding how people relate to technology. To me, that's been super, super fascinating, especially with all the highs and lows that have been going on in that space. The other part that's been really interesting to me is also watching how people sometimes, you know, they kind of go back to their conditioning. So at the beginning of quarantine, we heard a lot of companies going, we're going to be remote forever. You know, we're willing to accept a new feature of work. And now we're seeing some companies kind of roll back those policies and say, everyone has to be in the office now. But I have a firm belief that creators you know, highly skilled individuals, even some, a lot of the Gen Z people, they're going to say, no, we're not going to do this. We're looking forward to brighter, you know, a brighter, more personalized feature of work that I think will just benefit everyone. So I think there's been, there's been a lot of bad that's been happening, like, you know, Ukraine, all that. But I think there's also been some interesting sort of positive changes and trends as well. So I'm looking forward to see what happens, especially in the future of work. And it'll be interesting. That is impressive. <laughs> so this conversation is really to help us fill in the gaps as to how you progress from working in a hair salon to your current role as a senior machine learning platform engineer. So I would like to start by exploring your journey, starting with your educational background. Can you provide an overview into your university experience? and how it relates or does not relate to your journey as a machine learning practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was really interesting because no one would have expected me, I think, any, anyone who wasn't paying attention probably would have expected me to be such a failure at university. I was a massive, absolute failure. I say that because, you know, in high school, I was this very, very driven, overachieving person that in retrospect was kind of headed, headed for sort of a, a nervous breakdown for all the stuff that I was doing. And so I got into, I applied to a bunch of universities in the U.S., especially California. We have a very well-known university system called the University of California. We actually have three university systems there. We have the University of California, which is a public university system, but hosts some of the best research institutions in the U.S. The Berkeley is a name that people know, UCLA, I mean, UC San Diego. We also have like a CSC, California State University. It's considered Lower tier, still very good though. And then we also have a, you know, private sort of university system there as well. So my goal had basically been to 
exit high school with as many honors as possible, get into the best school, become a doctor, to do sort of good medical work. And it would also make my family very happy, like in the Japanese side, you know, because the holy trinity of careers, right, is doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? We, you get into one of those, you're solid. So I got into UC San Diego into biomedical engineering. It has one of the best biomedical engineering programs in the U.S. I got in there, had a bunch of scholarships, <clears throat> two of them for writing, actually. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So I had scholarships for my high school. One was in creative writing and one was in journalism. Got in there and basically proceeded to almost fail out for the next like two and a half years. And it was like flip-flop thing where... I would get almost like all F's and C's one quarter. And then we were on a quarter system. So fall, winter, spring, summer. Then the next quarter, I would basically have a bunch of A's and some B's. Then the, pre then the next quarter for that, F's and C's. So my GPA, I think that I was trailing at that point, was like a 2.2, 2, I want to say. That was a very, very dark time. All I knew was that basically I was getting notices like every other quarter from San Diego saying, we're going to kick you out. Okay. And that was like the worst thing possible. And it was also low enough to where they were going to start yanking some of the scholarships that I had, which my family could definitely not afford. Yeah, because we had one, like my mom worked. She's an accountant at a nonprofit. She doesn't have a degree. So she immigrates to this country, never got a college degree, kind of supported the family, it was myself, my dad. He was sick and couldn't really work most of the time. So she was supporting the entire household and helping to send me to college on like very little money. So we couldn't afford for me to sort of bail out. So at some point it was like, okay, realistically, the doctor reads not gonna work out. Like I'm not going to be able to get into medical school with my GPA. There's just kind of no hope for a return. And this was around like the third year. So at that point, I was like, okay, why don't I take some classes in something I do enjoy? So I ended up switching my major to anthropology with a minor in economics. And what, then my fifth year, um, just graduated. Yeah, what, go ahead. What is anthropology? Am I pronouncing that? Right? Yeah, yeah. So anthropology is the study of, I don't want to say human behavior, but it's the study of human culture and society and in some cases biological anthropology it a lot of times it's a study of our closest relatives yeah you know, in the family tree in the animal kingdom so monkeys apes all that sorts of stuff it's a very interdisciplinary field very much so like data science and machine learning because with anthropology there is a little bit of so there's a couple of different tracks you could do. You could try to study the human past, with, which is archaeology. You could try to study the human present, which is typically sociocultural anthropology. And you could do a study of our closest human relatives that are still existing, which is primatology or biological anthropology. But it involves a lot of things, for example, like if you're studying biological anthropology, you're also studying game theory. You're also studying behavioral ecology. If you're studying human studies and social cultural anthropology, a lot of times, for example, it can be like one of the most famous books was called In Search of Respect, mm -hmm. where this anthropologist, he went and he's, where did he, was it San Francisco or LA, where he, he studied gangs and drugs in LA, right? But you're trying to build this mental model of how people work. And when you're in that field, you realize that human behavior and human thought and even like human cultural patterns are very, very different. There's so much variety and there's no single one prescriptive way to do things. And that was a very fun experience is, for example, the paleo diet. Right. So there is an anthropologist over at Harvard who wrote some of the initial like papers or books that sort of popularized the paleo diet. And so she got to work with him and I got to essentially take classes on like human nutrition, you know, what are our bodies really equipped for looking at like evolutionary medicine. It was really, it was a fascinating immersion in this idea that humans are this really adaptable species. They have all sorts of different ways of doing things and there's no like one way to do things, even, even like parenting a kid, 
you would not think that that there's so much variation in that, but there is. Some people are like, no, no, in the wet, like, for example, in the U.S., it's a big thing that you have the baby room, you go decorate it, yada, yada, and then you, you coddle your kid until they're like five. So at that point, you know, they can lift a spoon in their mouth and read their ABCs. They're good. In a lot of other societies, baby sleeps, you know, in the same room and like even sometimes in the same bed as mom and dad. And then they are like at age two or three, they're understood to help out with the family. Really weird. But at the same time, it builds independence in a lot of those groups very early on. So the kids are taking care of their next generation at five, six, seven. They're helping with the cooking, cleaning. They're very, very independent. Yeah. What, was, what was interesting was I uh, came across a show on Netflix and it's from Japan and it shows two-year-olds doing errands for their parents. And it's like a documentary filming two-year-olds going to the shop to buy food stuff. With the parents and I was like, what? Two-year-olds literally going on the streets by themselves. And I was really amazed because we don't have that hair. I was like, safety issues or they could get lost. But yeah, that responsibility thing is the way kids are brought up in different societies. I wouldn't think it would differ so much. I thought, I would have thought there would be some emergent similarities in the way that kids are brought up, kids are brought up by their parents. But yeah. I was very shocked when I saw that show. I am going to watch it. It's like little short burst of episodes on Netflix. I forgot what yeah. it was. Yeah, um, and it's interesting because it's, you know, so when I graduated at fifth year, I would say that was like the beginning of me being able to, it set the foundations for me to be able to do a career like data science and machine learning. Because anthropology, it is, once again, it's a very interdisciplinary field. But you can also kind of pick and choose sort of your focus within it, you know? And also, too, you kind of need a variety of learning skills. Because once you understand that, once you start understanding that people are, in fact, very flexible, adaptable humans, and also there's a lot of different ways to do something right. Like, there are a lot of different ways to raise healthy kids. There's no one way. Then you start seeing kind of the possibilities in other fields, like data science and machine learning. Now, from a skills perspective, it prepared me not at all. No. I had, like, I couldn't program. I took some advanced math courses, right? Like calculus, linear algebra, differential equations, what have you, as part of the sort of undergraduate entering focus. But I graduated with probably the least technical degree you could actually get out of that university. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that was... That was really fun trying to find a job. It was like the only job I could get was a hair salon job from Craigslist because there was some weird stuff on Craigslist. <laughs> some weird jobs you wouldn't want to work, like being an executive assistant to a dude who ran like a bunch of clubs and produced glow sticks. Was it like nightclubs? Yeah, it was. Then that sounds kind of like you get free tickets to the clubs and whatnot. Yeah, but these aren't like the nice clubs with the oh. expensive like entry fees. Oh. These are these are some seedy clubs. So I was like, okay, okay. I'm not gonna do that on breaks list. The hair salons seem to be the most legit safe, legit job on Craigslist that I could find. Before we dive into the, the career aspect, I wanna actually ask this question. How did you educate yourself in artificial intelligence and data science since you're Degree didn't provide you with that skill. So how did you go about gaining that knowledge? Yeah. So one thing, so one thing I will say is that like my entry into data science and machine learning was very, very gradual. So I think it took me three to four years. So I graduated in 2013, worked there a song for how, like, you know, whatever, some months, then did a little bit of job searching for about know, two, three, five months. So from 2015 to 2016, 2014 to 2016, that's how long it kind of took me to get more into working as a data analyst. Okay. And then from 2016 to 2017 is when I started pivoting into data science. So for me, it was very, very gradual. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, it was... That's like 
kind of a little one good thing sometimes about basically graduating with like no options was it, it kind of you then have to sort of start from scratch and go okay well, what's the career that seems to hold the most promise for growth and longevity as opposed to stability so there's I wouldn't say there's anything stable about working in data science and machine learning, but I would say there's longevity in it because there's so much new stuff to learn. You can always improve. So I would do like a combination of, of things, a lot of book reading. I didn't have a whole lot of money at that point because I was working for a hair salon, the early stage star of whatever, but a lot, a lot of throwing money at O'Reilly books. Mm. And they were expensive for me at that time. I couldn't really afford it. So... I would try to find like the ebooks or PDFs, but eventually I, I'd go buy like the actual paper copy because what I would do is like I would sit on the bus and I would like highlight, take notes like all the time. Even when I was in my like, my, like gym sweats, it was gross. I'm just sitting back of the bus and you're just like huddled over the book and people are staring at you. So a lot of books. I use Data Camp quite a bit. I, I like them a lot because they're very short snippets. Kind of like tutorial style almost and it's a little bit more interactive i tried code academy but it wasn't really focused on like there was no emphasis on like data science like libraries and all that yeah i think that's more focused on the actual programming languages yeah absolutely a lot listening to podcasts a lot of medium articles so that i did that and also too i took classes from what we call like the junior colleges or state colleges so these are like colleges that you can kind of use to eventually then transfer into like one of the university systems. So I did classes there as well in databases and GIS and some other areas. I mostly started out in R though. That was like the first language because what ended up happening was that I was interviewing for my first startup job and they were like, do this analysis in R and so I had one of my friends, he's a neuroscientist, you know, he helped me, like, he, he helped put like, together an R script for me for the analysis for her, And then I just kind of like modified it yeah. for the take home. And so that was like the first language I ever learned. And that was in 2014. But eventually, you know, I got to the point where there's only so much self-study can help you. Because... What's happening is that there's kind of so many different areas to run into that when you're really new to the field and you don't have that technical foundation already, it is so easy to get spun around in different directions. And so when I eventually got like a hybrid data scientist and analyst role at Autodesk, I tried transferring to an internal data scientist team. And one of the girls there, she was super nice. And she was like, if you keep going the self-study route, you're never going to be able to transfer over. Yeah. She's like, because she's like, your knowledge is very spotty and also too, it's not very, it's not very strong, like in certain areas. I was going to, I'm going to tap into that actually, but before, yeah. this is a statement from one of your articles. It's prior to Springboard, I struggled to complete books and online courses or programs. So... <laughs> The whole self-study route does involve you taking a lot of online courses. And ideally, there's this sort of debate. Does it really prepare you for the practical world of data science? What's your opinion on that? Do you feel like it prepared you? Because from what you're saying, it seems like your knowledge was a bit gappy. There was a bit of gaps in your yeah. skill set. So what would be, be what was, what was your opinion on that? Yeah, it's so... I think there is, so there's two parts. One, it depends on learning style. I know for me, I'm someone that when I'm first getting going, learning a new area, I really need a structured environment. So mm -hmm. for example, when I first started working out, it, it, things went better when, or, or things kind of were a bit more consistent when I had like a trainer and I had a workout plan and I was working with a nutritionist and I knew exactly what I need to do every day because a part, part of that learning and part of, of building that map of knowledge, that, that mesh is knowing what to focus on. And that was like the really hard part of self-study was when you're new, 
it's very easy to get caught up in the tool race and to forget about learning the actual practice and like and principles underlying that area that you're studying. So I would say if it first depends on someone's learning style and also kind of where they are in their learning career. I think if you are, a, if you have a foot in that area, then MOOCs can be very, very useful. Okay. Like nowadays I like, I have Udemy courses that I have, I sign up for that I, that I complete now. Right. Same with course or courses. But when you're first starting, I think that's really, really hard to do the self-study on your own. Um, I think self-study is helpful when you're already sort of advanced or when you're just trying to dip your toes in it and just evaluate it. Does this even look interesting? Yeah. You know? How do you take those Udemy courses and Coursera courses now? Yeah. So yeah, so still a lot of those, a lot of that course is actually like the last two weeks, I was in a, a Monday to Friday nine to five boot camp for front end development. Am I ever going to become a front end engineer? Probably not. Just don't see it, you know, it's a different mindset, but I took it because I want to become a better MLOps engineering partner to our front end folks and also our data scientists. So I want to understand, you know, where are the models going? You know, what does like the load on the endpoints look like? What is the, even the sort of the design and kind of fabrication process. I want to understand that bit, but, you know, aside from that, I still do a lot of book readings, reading lots of articles, listening to YouTube talks, the Stanford system, Stanford ML systems, YouTube channel, like I found has been really great. And it's just, you have to do that to keep growing in this career. I think I, I was once mentoring at springboard because after i completed their program there i went back to mentor a little bit for their analytics course and i asked someone i'm always curious about someone's why some of them were totally committed to starting a new career in analytics some of them they were using it to augment their existing career maybe in like product management they wanted to essentially leverage data to do better at their jobs those are really really great use cases but this one lady she was trying to switch from baking she said she wanted something more stable. And I'm like, ooh, you're going from banking to data science. This is not a more stable route. This is not. It's, it's chaotic and it's growing and it's learning all the time. But if you like growing and learning all the time, or you're, you're the type where you kind of, when you sit by yourself, you go a little bit nuts. I think it's just like a great career. So that whole self-study, I think people just have to understand that that's like, that's the token you pay for yeah. doing really cool stuff. Exactly. And more importantly, really cool stuff comes through the prepared. You know, that's like that saying, right, about opportunity. If you don't kind of keep up with it, it's so easy to get just like tugged into different directions by all like the tooling wars and all like the vendor wars and all the arguments about which is better, R or Python. I've never. I thought it's funny. It's never actually programmed, you know, never touched it. I've just. Yeah. Python and uh, other languages, apart from R, which is, again, I'm not reading yeah. in that data science, that anal analyst, uh, analyst role, I'm more on the engineering side, but you did mention that there is no stability in the data science show. You mentioned that a few minutes back. What did you mean by that? It's like that argument of work-life balance, mm. right? It is a myth. And, but more importantly, like, you know, wh what is it trying to get at? So when people say work-life balance, I think what they are getting at is that they don't want to be burned out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they actually mean like we want stationary, like 40, 60, you know, like 60% work, 40% play, right? And it has to be between these hours. Some people probably do mean that, but I think others, what they mean is that at the end of the day, we don't want to feel like we just lost we just lost another day down the hole. Mm. We want to feel like we were engaged. We did cool work. We exercised our mental muscles that we have creative control over our destiny. You know, I think that's probably what people are getting at. And so when I say there's no stability in data science, machine learning, I mean, it's always going to be a dynamic balance of being sort of productive and active in the present but also sort of keep an eye out to your future. So I don't think lack of stability is a bad thing. Maybe what I should say is that there's no stagnation. There's no stagnation. 
So if you're someone that enjoys a very dynamic type of work that loves to keep learning, data science machine learning is great. The, those fields are also, especially if you are the type where you're like, okay, I've like kind of not mastered this area, but like, you know, I understand like, let's say computer vision models and algorithms. So now I want to focus on maybe more like systems design, right? Or maybe I want to focus more on, or maybe you've been focusing on system designs, but maybe you're like, okay, now I want to focus into like experimentation design. Very cool for, you know, how to actually test out or like models, right? That's fantastic. So if, if you're someone who can find joy in like in new things in yeah. the work every day, then the dynamic nature of being in this field, I think is like a really, really good thing. But for others, it can be scary. It can <laughs> be. Acknowledge that. You could, you can possibly burn out very quickly as well, because I always yeah. say in the eye and this field moves at the speed of innovation. So within yeah. three months, what you're using might be outdated if you're working with the state-of-the-art models. This is a new, a new state-of-the-art model. You got to read up the research paper on just to stay, just to even appear smart enough to actually be in conversations, right? But if you do enjoy this, if you have a growth mindset, it's fun. But one question I was going to ask is, can you attribute all your learning to a single O'Reilly book? Or if you could, what O'Reilly book would it be? I'll give you my answer. I want to hear yours first. That's a good question. It's funny. I'm looking at my books right now, I'm like looking over here. <laughs> oh, it's one that like calls to me. Yeah. Although it's funny. I actually just did a refresh too. I got rid of a bunch of them because I changed sort of focuses. I would say the three that's, the, the two that stuck out to me were the hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn. TensorFlow and all that, which I'm helping her actually review that book for the third edition. And then practical statistics for data scientists or data science from scratch, I think. Oh, you know what? Those three, those three were good, actually. I'm like, yeah, those are two different books. Data science from scratch, practical statistics for data scientists, I think, which is like the smaller one and then hands-on machine learning with TensorFlow Scikit-Learn. I feel like those three... People are pretty good, especially mm -hmm. like we're using TensorFlow and Keras. We have the same book, actually just one, which is the hands-on tutorial with TensorFlow and, and Keras. That's my first book. I know, I know I said one, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say two. Deep Learning with Python, I think, by Francois Cholet. Also a great book as well. Yeah, so that's, those two books are pretty good and pretty dope that you're reviewing the third edition of Hands-On. Straight up. Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty it it's pretty cool because it's like it's actually been a while since I've gone through the the entire book again. So I'm hoping this will be a nice like refresh too as I like go through it. Cause I've been like so focused on like ML ops and like what? more like system design and data engineering stuff. Like yeah, like the three books I'm basically like living with right now are designing data intensive applications, okay. database internals, and oh my God, what's the third one? Alex Zoo's like system design books are, are right, are also like right next to my bed. So I do all that for reading. And there's another third book. I've been living in that space for so long that it'll be really nice to get back through the hands on machine learning. Yeah. So that'll be good. How did you get the opportunity to review? that book because yeah so that was through a friend who is writing a book with them so he had pinged me up he had pinged me he had said hey like they asked me if i need any book reviewers can you go review this book and i'm like sure why not and the reason why i'm asking is that is really something that you can put in your cv that makes you stand out because most machine learning data science folks they know about the book hands-on from the first edition to the second to the new one that's going to come out. So if, if so, like a hiring manager or a manager, a data science manager was to see that you reviewed the book, that's like a, okay, they must know some stuff, right? So yeah, it will be interesting to see if there's any sort of path to becoming a book reviewer and if you use that for clout in your CV. Yeah, it's interesting because there's this guy that I follow on LinkedIn. He was an entry manager over at Uber. He writes a lot, especially on like mobile development, mobile iOS development. He has a blog called The Pragmatic Engineer. And he had a really, 
fascinating take on how people can leverage engineering. And I think this applies to data science and machine learning to become like one person businesses. He had noted that he has a lot of engineering friends that are trying to become like content creators full time. And he's like, first off, that's very hard. It's very competitive. But instead of thinking of yourself as a content creator and then like an engineer, he's like, why don't you think of yourself as a one person business, like a solopreneur? Right. So yes, content creation could be a part of your portfolio of businesses, but so could consulting. And so could write like writing articles. So could freelancing, even working full time too while doing all that or part time. Like I know people who are have a part-time gig and they're doing all those other things in their like respective areas, you know? So he's like, think about it like that. You don't actually have to bucket yourself into something. You know, you can kind of be a little bit more labelless, or you can label yourself with something that's a little bit more holistic and that allows you to pursue and encompass a bunch of different activities. So to me, that was really inspiring. And what I try to do is I try to... I try to let people know the kinds of opportunities I'm interested in. And I also like build relationships with them, especially like within that space. And what I find is that eventually, like if I stay in touch with them enough, the right opportunity comes like their way. They'll usually kind of reach out and they'll, they'll just like say to me, Hey, are you interested? Because that was one opportunity that came very organically. There was another one with LinkedIn that also came organically. There is another one. Yeah, like there is a ton of different ones where I'm like, I don't, I didn't really plan for it and I didn't seed it either. Like it just came when people are like, oh yeah, like I thought, I thought about you, you know? Mm-hmm. And I do the same too. Whenever I have an opportunity that like comes my way for different things, like usually I have like a list of names and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go send send these people to you. You have a very sort of a useful network. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, honestly. That was my next question. How did you do that? (laughs) Before we get into the content creation and the network inside of the machine learning industry, I want to ask a sort of a question. You've interviewed a lot of folks and I wanted to quickly ask how important is it to have a degree in AI in order to secure a role within the domain? Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit of a nuanced answer. Some companies care very, very heavily about a degree and like, you know, about your credentials. Right. And some teams within those companies care even so much so that is basically a requirement. So for example, Google brain, I think that's the name. It's like they're super smarty pants research group. Yeah, good luck getting in there without a PhD. But I would like to point out that Google Brain, it probably represents maybe, oh, oh, I don't know, like 2% of like the, like research focused AI jobs out there. Okay. And in the future, I think they're going to represent even less because essentially like we're seeing a lot of companies, like, especially like as we make AI a lot more accessible and even the tooling, for example, like. My understanding was when Python first came out, no one would have thought that it would have actually been a good language for research or prototyping because it was so slow. There's no way this is going to eventually run like a bunch of scientific libraries, but because the language is simpler, it's closer to kind of like how people sort of speak English, you know, also to like, you can do operator overloading. So there's a lot of reasons why eventually it it has become kind of one of the de facto languages like within data science, but it didn't start out that way. Apparently, according to some people who were around when Python came out, they were like, yeah, no one would have expected it to become the de facto language. Most people would have thought that you would need something with the speed of C++, but you know, but especially as ecosystems of libraries have built up too, like around Python, it just shows you that you can't predict the future from the now. But more importantly, too, like you have to go with the now with as much information. So how that ties back into the interviewing the jobs. Google Brain is not, and some of the other top like AI research teams, those are not the only teams that are looking for people. Those are the teams that are doing cutting edge stuff and they have the strictest requirements. 
But the fascinating part is that the other 95% of jobs out there probably don't need that. So, you know, so if you're going for like the, the best, the most stringent, the thing that everyone wants, it is always going to be competitive. Mm -hmm. The other aspect too is whether someone is interested in research work versus more engineering work. There are some roles out there like a thought, like applied researcher, you know, applied scientist, whatever, where they do mix it. But what I find is that it is very helpful if people are honest with themselves from the get-go. And a lot of people, what I get the sense from mentoring was that a lot of people who go for these research roles actually really aren't interested in doing research. They'd probably be happier in a more sort of product or engineering focused role. And I think there, once again, like if you're more focused on like the product entry focused role, you really don't need a PhD or master's, you know? So I think this, the, the short answer to the very, very long answer is there are some roles for which you will need a degree to be competitive, but there are a lot more roles for which you don't need the degrees to be competitive. Yeah. But the other aspect is you cannot get a job without experience. So what does that mean? A lot of people think experience needs to come from a prior employer, and that's not true, right? The reason why a lot of people pursue degrees, for example, like a master's in AI, is because they've tried the self-study route and it doesn't work for them. But there are other people for whom self-study could actually work for them, and they should feel empowered to make that choice. And the other part too is understanding that like there are really, really good jobs, not at the fan companies. Like big tech is not the only place to find really cool stuff. It was funny because uh, I, I interviewed for MailChimp because they were not based in San Francisco. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia. And I basically wanted to experience what it was like working outside Silicon Valley. And what I find is that the people are a lot nicer first off. A lot more friendly, a lot more warm, a lot more humble. Why do you think that is? It's funny because when people think Silicon Valley and San Francisco, they have a very specific type of person they're thinking about. So they're thinking about white males who probably went to Stanford or Yale, who have BC funding, they're working on startups, they're working on big tech. You know, they have their... Their Patagonia vests with their slacks and their button downs or, or whatever, right? Or even their like, their t shirt from a hackathon yeah. with like jeans and like their scuffed like trainers, right? That's what they think. And I'm like, that's, that's 100% not the San Francisco I grew up with. The San Francisco I grew up with was second to fifth generation Chinese Americans, Eastern Europeans, because that was the school I went to, was a lot of immigrants like my mom. She immigrated here too from Japan. A lot of people from like middle class backgrounds, middle class or, or you know, lower class backgrounds, a lot of like working in the community. Like, I don't know, it's just very different. So I think what ends up happening is that we have a lot of these transplants that come in and they're coming here for tech jobs. And I feel guilty because I, I'm a techie, right? Like working and living in San Francisco. But they come, for, come into these tech jobs and they don't really care to sort of integrate into the community, you know? And then of course the community gets, just gets gentrified and all this other stuff. But the sad part is they're also the most vocal and they're the ones that are used to represent Silicon Valley and San Francisco. And it's, that's 100% not like, not the people I grew up with. It's really funny when people are like, oh, you're a unicorn. I haven't met a native San Francisco. I'm like, yeah, because... Honestly, they're probably like making your coffee and like serving you, or they're not like publicizing it because they're hanging out with their other San Francisco friends that they grew up with, right? They're getting, they're getting beers with them, you know? But yeah, it's been a real, it's been a breath of fresh air. Like, so I, I know I really encourage people to like, if they, especially if they come from like a non-traditional background or they don't have the right degree, but they have the skills and capabilities to really consider applying for either small, medium-sized businesses, companies in like other industries, even companies doing interesting engineering challenges, but they're not like the big tech, you know? Like, and you can still get paid really well. So when we're talking financial possibilities in data science, 
Tell me, what's been the highest salary you've seen a data scientist earn? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Let me, let me think. And I mean, this is a good one. This is also a good thing to look at. There's Glassdoor and there's also, oh God, was it Ladders? That's another good one. So there is a site where engineers post their levels Mm -hmm. and they post their levels and they post their title and the company. I think the highest one I saw was like, at Netflix, where it was almost like, and I almost don't believe this, but they said it was like 350K to 400K without equity. Okay. A data scientist, 350K. Yeah. I think they were a very senior data scientist or staff. I... I don't know if I believe the equity part, but I've heard like Netflix gives you the the choice to kind of leave the equity on the table. So they give you a little bit less cash than they would like the equity value. That's the highest I've seen there. I think OpenAI, they definitely pay, I don't know if they pay like quite close to that, but probably for their senior or staff like researchers. I think, I think the reason why they're paid so much is because they're kind of contributing like new knowledge to the field. Like they're pushing a little bit further, you okay. know? So would you say if you were to have like a master's or PhD, it gives you a sort of like bargaining power for higher salaries later on? I think it gives you bargaining power earlier on, but I think it, it tapers off actually as you go into your career. So for example, I've been in the field and related stuff since like, I want to say 2015. Right now, people don't even ask me about like my master's mm. or undergrad. GPA never comes up. I don't post it. They're a lot more interested in, in sort of the value, like the work that I've done. And also they're a lot more interested in how I can sort of integrate and incorporate, like kind of help bridge teams, especially engineering and product teams and data scientists. So actually create sort of new value for the company. Yeah, you're right. They don't usually talk about the masters or even go into it, but I feel like there's a process before the interview where your masters or your qualifications come into play, which is a filtering process. So when you have a lot of CVs, you certainly for, you certainly look for keywords and uh, qualifications to sort of just filter out into the, into a lower number of candidates. As in here, you conduct interviews, do you use qualification as a filter? when you're looking at CVs? So it depends on the area. So for example, for data science, which has been around now for a few years, people, some, I mean, a lot of companies will still use, they will still use degree. And I think that's very, very misguided because a lot of their work is not, and and this is like the interesting part because people are like, if I get a master's versus a PhD, you're doing different things than a master's versus a PhD. In a PhD, you're doing research, right? You're, you're producing a paper, you're producing a thesis, whatever. In a master's, typically you're just taking the classes. So I don't think there's anything wrong with getting a master's as long as people are doing it for the learning and the development. If they're doing it to get a job, this is where I get a little bit like, mm, I don't know if the ROI is there. Because when I was mentoring at a science stream job, which is basically focused on, on helping people get their interviews and get job offers, right? We saw plenty of people with PhDs and master's, start, master's degrees there who couldn't get a job. Okay. Like, and the reason why they couldn't get a job a lot of times was because they didn't know how to message themselves. They didn't know how to brand their particular experiences and skills. They were literally getting stuck on the first interview, right? So just getting past the filter itself does not guarantee you an offer. And we saw plenty of them where it's like, okay, you need to learn how to target your audience. You need to learn how to talk to to people who are not as smart as you. And then by smart, I mean like they don't have that same domain expertise. That's why they're bringing you in because you have domain expertise that they don't. They're not just bringing you in to do work that they all always already know how to do, right? So, So just having the degree itself will not guarantee you that filter. And for me personally, so I think right now, even without like a master's degree, 
or actually even like a relevant BS undergrad degree. I probably get three or four recruiters a week just hitting me up for like senior staff roles. So, and even before that, when I was sort of a little bit more junior, I only had like two years under my belt. I think my acceptance rate was maybe close to 20%, 20 to 40%. Okay. Cold, cold applying. Okay. And the, what, what you have right now, where you have recruiters coming to you four times a week, that is from all the stuff you've been doing, all the content you've been putting out within the field. You've made yourself very visible on social platforms, Medium and LinkedIn. So, yeah, so you get these opportunities coming to you. And, and I want to make a statement that I took out from your articles. You said data science interview can feel like a special brand of hell. Mm, yes, right? I can. Yeah. So I want to, what, what did you experience interviewing for data science or was it, what was the hell you experienced? Part of the frustration of data science interviews is the fact that a lot of companies, they interview like they are Facebook Google, Apple, Netflix, when they are not those companies. So what I mean by that is there are roles like the super smarty pants AI researcher doing, you know, state of the art models and algorithm development, maybe like what, one to 5% of people would maybe qualify for that kind of role because of, because it requires so much like you need to be a domain expert, like in your area. You need to also be able to like prototype all the work that you're doing. But the other 95% of jobs out there, which can kind of still be split along sort of like more research focus versus product engineering focus. A lot of companies, they pass perfectly good candidates or like they will drop them very early on the process because their interview process is terrible. So for example, if you're trying to interview someone who they're not creating state-of-the-art models. They're using state-of-the-art models to create new product features. Why would you then interview them as if they were creating the state-of-the-art models? Like, yes, they should understand how it works. They should be able to read the paper. But at the end of the day, like their focus for you as a business is to drive your bottom line. Like that, that is what it is. So that's a slightly different sort of skill set required than to be creating state-of-the-art. Right. And the other part too, is that a lot of companies, they argue that it is, it's hard to hire. And it, it is definitely like we found within the ML ops space and I've heard in the data engineering space, it can be really hard to find good candidates. Mm. And there are reasons why in each of those areas, but in a field like data science, I think by this point, people should know what they're looking for in a candidate. If you had to summarize what a candidate needs to provide in like three bullet points, that already should tell you how you should be interviewing. And more importantly, if you're a smaller company, you can't kind of turn your nose up at like non-traditional candidates. Because guess what? Non-traditional candidates, they're hungry for experience. They'll work just hard, maybe even harder sometimes than your more traditional pipeline candidates. Because first off, they know that like, there's not that many opportunities or companies that like will look at them. I know that, or at least that's how I felt when I was like interviewing. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what, how do I even compete with a lot of these like degreed folks? And the answer is that I can't. So I should try to compete with them. Instead, I should try to compete with them in a playing field that I, I can do very well. And what I can do very well is I can talk to people. I can build relationships. I can organize stuff. And I... I'm very obsessive about driving like value. I don't like doing work for the sake of shiny stuff. I like doing projects and work because I know there's a very, very big impact that can come. I'm very lazy in that regard. I don't want to do something if the only reason to do it is it's shiny and it's new. I'm like, no, that is not good enough. There has to be a reason to do it. <laughs> like, why are you having me create this app for you? Why are you having me create this five one for you? No, oh, just because it's fun. No. What does the product need? I've had situations where folks want to use machine learning, deep learning models to solve yeah. very simple problems. You just solve them just trigonometry or something. It's just, yeah. you just want to use machine learning models to say you're using machine mm -hmm. learning. There's no need for that. That could take us into this next question. What are common 
misconceptions you've come across that has to do with what it takes to become a data scientist or machine learning engineer? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say, well, I'm going to avoid the ones that we, that people always talk about. So the first one is that you don't need to code to succeed in data science. In the long term, yes, you do. 100%. All the best performing data scientists I know, they are also good at code. Are they going to create their own full stack applications one day? No, not really. Probably not. They are definitely very well versed in using Git, sort of version control. They can kind of set up their own CI CD. They know how to write their own tests. They know how to do data validation. They know how to create a POC. Like the most successful senior staff data scientists I know are very, very capable of, of doing that. So if you're a data scientist, you're like, I don't need to know how to code because all my work is model training or whatever. That's just going to hurt you in the long term. Another one is that I hear a lot is that boot camps are a waste mean and they're a scam. As a boot camp graduate of Springboard, I don't. I, there are definitely some that are scams. Absolutely, people need to do their due diligence. But for a lot of candidates, boot camps are a great way to go. So for my boot camp experience, you know, with my undergrad GPA, I was not eligible to attend any graduate schools. Literally not a single one would accept me. So I'm like, okay, well, I know I need to get a jump start into the career. I've been doing the self-teaching. So what do I do? So looking at boot camps, Springboard, the cost was relatively low for a boot camp because it was $1,750 per month. But even at that point, like $1,700 a month, I'm like, that's the cost of my rent. But it also allowed me to work full time. So I wasn't dipping into my savings I, and I was able to keep my same lifestyle. It was great. Like I was going to work. I was going to the gym. I was doing the boot camp. I was still going out to eat at like restaurants. You know, I was like, we were doing movie nights for date night, all this other stuff. So it was great, you know, yeah. and more importantly, it was, there's a mentor who I still keep in touch with. Rajiv Shah, and he's, I think, a principal data scientist over at Snorkel AI. I think they do semi-supervised labeling or something. I, I forgot quite exactly what they do, but Chip Hulian used to work at Snorkel AI. So I still keep in touch with my mentor, who I met during the program. It was project-focused. It focused on just the very minimum, you know, like the, the confirmed tool stack that people are using. So Python, like a few other tools and libraries. Mm -hmm. So it was, for me, it was great. I don't think boot camps are a waste. I do think people go into them uninformed about what a boot camp will actually provide you. And a boot camp is really just a launch pad, you know, yeah. especially if someone's been struggling with self-teaching. It gives you that structure you were talking about. Can you talk about the advantages of boot camps then? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll talk about the advantages and also sort of wrap it with who should maybe consider it. So first off, if you're a non-traditional candidate, boot camps are a great way to go. Like, for example, if you could not get in, like me, could not get into graduate program, but you have like the capability and skill and, and drive. And also boot camps are a little bit sink or swim. So if you're like self-motivated, a self-starter, you're proactive. They can be great. The other part that was really nice was some boot camps are like in person, you know, nine to five, Monday to Friday, you go in and all that. For me personally, I couldn't, because I had experienced how hard it was to get a job in data science machine learning, I was not really willing to sort of take the risk of having that gap on my resume. So it was hard. They didn't have a social life during the nine months that it took me, but I also had no debt. I had no debt. I had a little bit more money coming out of the program than I did coming in. Not because the money program paid me money, but you know, because I was working the entire time and I got a raise at some point. And then other advantages I think are super important. This one was essentially like self-paced. So they had the material and you go in to on your own and then you check in with a mentor. So the self pace was great because there were just some days or nights where I'm like, I can't do this. Like I had too much stuff going on. Like I, I had the energy to go through the content, but I didn't have the energy to work on the project. So there were some days I had a batch working on like my capstone project. Right. So I think that's really great, especially for people who have like a lot of like responsibilities, especially their family or 
maybe they're holding down two jobs or whatever, that self-paced is great, especially if you can kind of keep yourself to that. The mentorship was awesome. So that is something that people should look for in a good boot camp is you have a mentor relationship, right? And that mentor is an, you know, is an industry expert and industry professional. So my mentor, it was funny while I was doing the boot camp, I did like a mini, I, I kind of did my own apprenticeship, like at my company, because there wasn't really a need for me to do like machine learning models at the job that I was doing at the time. So what I would do, and it's really kind of funny, every week I would learn something in the boot camp. And then I would go do it in a project at work. Okay. Like I would go like create my own project. So I would start, so I was doing two projects at the same time, you know, you can use some of the same code actually, which is really funny. But so it was like doing that also helped me say to recruiters like, oh, by the way, like, you know, I did this project while I was working as an analyst here and this provided value. Because what ends up happening, right, is that people, they do the bootcamp, they do their project portfolio, or even they do a portfolio, like, in their own time. And then recruiters will inevitably ask the question, oh, was this a personal project or did you do it yeah. at a job, right? This is the power of, like, doing projects, like, you know, doing, like, self-initiated projects at your job at work. Because for better or worse, it lends a lot more cachet to that conversation with the recruiter. And I knew that. So that's, 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 that's basically what I did. And I was also able to kind of help mentor and educate people around me on what I was learning from the boot camp. So it was like boot camp, learning, then going to like project, then going to work project, then going to people. So it crafted a very, very powerful narrative of like, yes, I am a person who works well with people. I like mentor and educate people around me. You know, I help start like innovation, like in my area. You know, and that's going to be a very, very powerful tool. So that's something that a bootcamp can allow you to do that if you were to just kind of go off and do a full-time degree, it would be very, very hard to do. You know, it's to say this project that I did, there was in fact business value added. Exactly. So that's like something that's really nice. There's one thing I want to say. Does a good bootcamp give you support in finding a job after? Some of them will. To be honest, that's why I ended up doing the assigned stream job was because there was some support for interviewing, but not as much as I would have liked. So I ended up joining the assigned stream job and that was two to three months of really focusing in on my resume, focusing on my interviewing skills, all that jazz. So it would be nice, but I would, it, it would be nice if good you know, a lot of the boot camps had that. I think the best ones will definitely, but I, I don't know if it's like guaranteed. Yeah. You know, but this is where people need to do their due diligence, right? Because if they, and this is also why I tell people, be really careful about quitting your job to go do a boot camp or even to do a degree program because it is uncertain. And there might be a period of like, I've heard it's up to like three, six months after the boot camp for which, you know, they don't have a job. In my head, it's a little bit easier to like work full-time or part-time and then take longer in the degree because there's still a chance that you can take the learnings from the boot camp or the degree program like into your actual job. And there's a chance that you can get promoted. You could go adjacently to another job, things like that, right? I think I'll be going into the closing questions and I want to ask you a question. When will you see yourself as successful within this domain? Yeah. I mean, for me personally, like I'm targeting to become a, a staff engineer right now. I'm a senior engineer, so I'm targeting to be a staff. I figure that'll take like at least two or three years. What does that rule entail? Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between a staff and senior is, as far as I can tell, is first off, skills that experiences. Like they, they are the go-to person for technical strategy. They are capable of creating their own like features or applications internally. I'm mostly focused on like internal sort of data science, data science developer tooling. That's sort of like my area, then infrastructure. So they're able to take like crucial components and either build it entirely themselves or they're able to create like a tiger team or a skunk works team to like go launch that to delivery. They also do a lot of mentoring. They do a lot of education. And in some cases they also serve as kind of 
not fully, but they sort of help evangelize a lot of the initiatives internally. So that's where I'm kind of aiming at for the next two, three years. But I, I feel like I'm very successful now, actually, in my career, because right now my job supports my family lifestyle. It supports my interests. I get to work on cool people with cool projects with awesome people. Multi-city lifestyle. If I want to, I can go work in and other you- cities. I just I just choose not to because my, my workshop is here. So I do clothing and sneakers. I design clothing and sneakers for fun. And you can't take a sewing machine. You can't take like a leather industrial sewing machine with you. It's just, it's very big. You know, there's certain things that you can't take with you, right? So, you know, I stay here for the workshop, but yeah, my career feels really good right now. So if I were to be laid off right now, I have like 50 recruiters I can go talk to. Yeah. Gigs. And I, and I won't be taking like a salary cut. And actually with the, with the market as it is, I'll probably be, be getting a salary bump. A very massive one. Yeah. <laughs> a very, yeah, potentially depending on the market and the company, but yeah, I feel pretty successful now, but I think the next step for me is I want to get to staff. And then at that point, I'm going to think about that solopreneur, mm. one person business. That doesn't mean I'm going to like quit my job or anything, but I do want to understand what it looks like to be, to be able to do different things, especially within like the, the current space I'm in. Yeah, I already feel like you are doing a lot of different things. You're on LinkedIn, you're on Medium. Yeah, I've seen more videos of you on YouTube as well. So it feels like, yeah. well, on, it feels like you are doing a lot of different things. This conversation has been very enlightening. It's been great having you on this uh, podcast, Mikiko. And hopefully when we do part two, we'll be speaking to Mikiko, the staff engineer. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thanks so much for speaking with me. It's really great to finally get to meet you.